All right, we're live. I'm here with my brother, Roy Roach. It's been a minute since we've caught up and I'm so glad to reconnect with you. Thank God for social media it can be used for so many negative purposes, but here we're using it for good. And I just wanted to reminisce a little bit. The way him and I met is I originally saw him giving a talk on being an academic hustler on failures and successes. And for those of you who don't know, it was a time in which we spent as two black men in the legendary North Dakota. That's not a title I made up. We, we lived on the border of Minnesota. And whenever you go to the Minnesota side and come back in, there's a giant sign that says, welcome to the legendary North Dakota. So without further Thanks. ado, please tell, tell us about how you first off made it there. I assume you weren't born in North Dakota and then how you became an academic hustler. Hey, gotcha. Hey, you know, first of all, thank you for inviting me on this platform, man. It was good to just recently link up with you. And I second, like you said, uh, using social media and technology to really maintain these relationships as we've had over the time. Uh, but to go back to it, yes, you know, I gave a presentation and that's how we connected. And I'm glad to see that it's still going. But I ended up uh, coming to North Dakota back in late 2007, early 2008, little gray area. I um, actually moved there from Japan with my family. We had previously been stationed um, in the Air Force base in um, mainland Japan. And then after being there for several years, we ended up in North Dakota. Uh, I like to tell the joke, you know, we showed up, uh, got off the plane. It was maybe October, November, and I had shorts and a pair of pants <laughs> on, or, or a shirt and a pair of pants on. It's already snowing and crazy. So of that course. was my rude awakening to North Dakota. Yeah, that 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 negative, you know, I had experienced growing up in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley out here where a lot of films are produced in up to 110 degree weather playing football. You know, we would find reprieve from the 110 degrees by going into the shade for 100 right. degrees. So to go from that extreme to negative 20, negative 25 degrees in North Dakota. I remember some right. of them would tell me that they would pray for 30 degrees positive before they would want 90 degrees because they would lose their mind at 90 degrees heat. Like they would prefer, they would be in shorts, like you said, in positive 30. Right. Like, And, and that was one of the first thing I knew, like the first year of being there, it's like you could tell the difference between zero and one degree. And I'm sure you heard this one thing where it was like, it gets too cold to snow in North Dakota. Oh like that was, oh, you don't understand it until you actually experience too cold to snow. And so it was almost, you know, once it started snowing, that was an indicator that was actually starting to warm up. And so yeah. we was actually <laughs> excited about it. Uh, but I, I think I, uh, I just remember, I think I uh, missed the first question that you asked was like, how did I become an academic hustler? So long story short, uh, eventually I decided I was going to do a couple of things. And eventually when you and I met, I had already began my master's degree in higher education. And I was asked to give a presentation on my story and where I came from. And that's how we landed in the academic hustle. But we can go into the details, the timeline's getting there, but I'm, I'm following in your, uh, your lead on this one. Oh no, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah. we can talk about that. Like I was thinking like I'm getting afflicted by all of this cold. I need to at least get me some snow angels. I saw snow angels in the movies growing up. You know what I mean? With the right, snowman and, and uh, you know, the red fat guy that is promoted by Coca-Cola, right? For Jolly right, cool. Nicholas, all these things. And I'm like, where, where is it? Where is it happening? And then someone told me, oh no, don't you know? Like, <laughs> there's none of that. It's too cold. It's right. too cold. The creek is frozen. There's, no, yep. there's none of that, you know? Ice so, fishing, you know, getting a block heater. That was a thing. Everywhere you pulled up, there was always like the extension to plug your car. And I was like, what is a block heater? Let alone, you tell me I have to plug my car in so it doesn't freeze overnight. Man, I, I had just a few like random stories. I had people tell me, because one time uh, I, I was living a mile from where we were working at the university and I just wanted to beast it. So I, I wore everything one day and just went and walked in the negative 20 degree weather. And they said, don't ever do that again. You can die. They said in North Easily. Dakota, it's illegal for you not to offer somebody a ride if they're yeah. requesting it on the side yeah. of the road during winter because they very well may die. And that AAA itself may not arrive to wherever you are if your car breaks down. Um, unless, you know, like f it's four hours later so that you need to have like uh, enough like linen cloth or something to wrap yourself in. I had other situations where I didn't realize that I had my detergent in the back of my car. And when I go saving it for after work, that uh, that's a bad decision because by the time I actually go to do laundry after work, it's frozen rock solid. And I was yeah. saved by a Nepalese family. I ended up actually writing a blog about that one time, comparing it to the idea of the, the Good Samaritan. You know, these people right. did not speak 
English that well, but in that moment, out of the charity of their heart, you know, they helped me out and they gave me their their non frozen, um, their non frozen detergent because they they realized what had happened, like the mistake that I had made there. So yeah, we can talk a lot of, a lot about the cold, but yeah, I'm interested in. Could you tell us kind of, uh, you know, as much as you remember? I know it's a like four years ago now, but uh, a little bit of what it meant to you about being an academic hustler and perhaps how, you know, down the line you might build on that brand. Absolutely. Uh, so when I first uh, went off to college, um, I had graduated high school in uh, Japan and I had went off, you know, I had a good football experience there. You know, I had a couple emails and people reach out for interest. And I originally went off to a &T to play football there. And as a first generation college student, uh, there was a lot of things that I had to learn. One specifically was that I didn't have an immediate family at the college that I went to in North Carolina. And so anything that I had to learn, I was learning it on my own. And then, you know, when challenges came, I eventually had to like, there was one time like the loan didn't come through. And mm -hmm. if, if you know about HBCUs, for those that are listening, uh, you know about validation. Like they don't even let you finish the class until you're validated. You know, where at other schools, even if your balance isn't paid, they allow you to stay there for the remainder of the semester. So you can imagine, you know, 18 year old coming off, you know, moving back to the States yeah. and being told, hey, you got to get out the the, uh, the dorm rooms and you can't go to classes until you get validated. I'm like, yo, I live in Japan. Like this, this is not my <laughs> home. Like what am I supposed to do? Throw me out. And so, you know, long story short, I ended up getting hurt, you know, took some time off from football. Not going to lie, it definitely has some challenges when it came to academics. Uh, but later on, when it came to being in North Dakota, it was one of the awakening points where when I moved to North Dakota, I was at a time in my life where I was ready to make a decision that I was going to be focused, that I was going to be disciplined, I was going to create a path for myself. Uh, long story short, I waited two years to join the Air National Guard there, where I'm proud to serve in the Air Force as an EMT because I originally wanted to be a doctor. Beautiful. I got into UND. I was like, all right, my game plan, if I get into the military, that gives me stability, structure. And then when I get back, I'm just going to throw a, you know, a Hail Mary, get into the school and just take care of business. And so when I got into the school, you know, I remember the letter saying uh, specifically, like, you've been admitted. But here's one of the things that I noticed that kind of changed my mindset was that I didn't get the typical letter and welcoming like everybody else got. I noticed everybody else got their shirts and things like that. You know, mm -hmm. welcome to BCU. Mine just said, uh, you've been admitted to, uh, I'm sorry, you've been admitted to University of North Dakota, excuse me, uh, but you've been admitted based on like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Probation, because my oh. GPA, when I transferred to UND was, you know, a little bit low. And so they wanted to say, okay, we're admitting you, but you're going to have to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. What kicked off was that, you know what? You're telling me I got to get a bare minimum of a 2.0? Bet. Watch me work. And I can't remember the exact semester, but I remember knocking it out the park. I was above a 3.0, ended up getting invited to uh, be part of the National Honors of Scholastic Leaders, whatever it is. But it, it put me on a, a path towards success. And up until that point, I realized in that moment after that first semester that it wasn't my, my grades wasn't a reflection at my previous institution because I was incapable of doing anything. I just didn't have a plan and a mindset. And so after taking time off, living in Japan, joining the military, I had all this experience where my goal was, how do I make this mine? And so where a lot of the students, they're like, they're following the platform. And I'm like, nah, this is mine. I'm gonna knock it out the park. I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna make the networks that I need to do. And I started to figure out what works, what doesn't. You know, when you think about a hustler, they're thinking about what's efficient, what's essential, and what's not essential. So long story short, I made the connections and I met some amazing people, started putting in a lot of work outside of just class. And then when I began sharing my story of how I even came to North Dakota, I was asked to get that presentation. And really essentially that's what I gave in that presentation where you know I had some failures, but then I had to learn how to accept success where at some points I was regretful that I did not do it the first time but understanding the value of developing the hustler's mentality that I'm going to hustle to get what I need to get done led me to the point where I gave that presentation. Sorry, that was a little bit long-winded, but... No, don't apologize, brother. That's yeah. what this forum is for. This medium is is for people who are not allergic for the long-form conversation. You know, we'll have Come very flex. <laughs> like, this is three nuggets right here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's what we're doing. But I really like how you're describing the discipline and the intentionality that you brought from there. And 
that you know it it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows like there there was some some rocks along your path but you just kept going along to to get to the place where you are right now to be able to be working in academe right. for a little context of the people about the networking that he's saying and and just for those of you who didn't know uh backwards I know sometimes we use some acronyms that people might not know HBCU is a historically black college and university for those who don't know I'm sure a lot of people do know but just in case they don't and uh, he was telling us a little bit about his time there but throughout that path you're implementing discipline and intentionality and then focusing on networking i see you it was either at the women's center or the international center i remember it was close by to where i was working and i was at the time establishing the first full time organizational ombudsman office there which shout was, out uh, <laughs> shout out establishing the first come on <laughs> we tried to right we tried to and um Uh, you you had reached out to me at that time because you said you had surveyed a lot of higher education but you didn't know quite what this organizational ombudsman i mean it's a weird word it's it's a scandinavian word and it happened to be a population with a lot of scandinavian background uh, right. just happenstance but who hadn't implemented this actual beautiful institution that comes from from the swedish and the norwegian which means this representative of the people or this this person who stands as a as a middleman and and tries to channel uh, to be an informal channel for conflict so if i, if I don't know how much you recall or you you, you said you kind of still think about it sometimes what was your experience like being the intern of the ombuds office the first one at the university gotcha. of north dakota gotcha shout out to henick for uh, even accepting my invitation or my request to be an intern there i remember uh, in our second year of our masters program getting um Uh, in higher education. Uh, so quick backtrack, I got my undergrad in mass communications uh, with a minor in media studies. I, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to be a doctor, but I took an education in a business class and it completely changed my life. And I remember having a mentor there, uh, Leroy's, Dr. Leroy's bachelor now. Um, but I remember just seeing how she was able to create a life where she is able to create jobs and then help students and just live a great life. And that to me, uh, was very inspiring because I never had really learned about entrepreneurship. And so that really started to get my mind thinking like an entrepreneur, solving problems creatively. And so the problem that I had, or at least that I saw for myself in my master's was that everyone wanted to do their internships and you know, uh, financial aid and missions and everybody's trying to go after the, the normal stuff. And I was like, man, what, where's something interesting that would challenge me that I've never heard about? And I remember hearing something about an ombudsman. I'm like, First of all, how do you spell it? Uh, <laughs> I can spell it now. Uh, second of all, um, uh, how do I get involved with it? And so that's where you and I just happen to connect. So we're starting to see that our interaction was almost preordained, you know, not even to get too high. But, you know, that interaction led us to realize that, oh, you are the ombudsman. I've been looking for this experience to do something new. Um, so when we got there, you welcomed me in, you know, we had our hours and then you just really walked me through the process of what being an ombudsman is. Why is it important? Why is it different? What are the things that people just don't know about? And then what role can this play in university for the students, for the staff, for the faculty? And now working in academia, I see why it is important. You know, <laughs> you taught me about mediation. You told me I had to read through all these pages to really understand <laughs> before you would even let me do anything. But I appreciate that because what you did was you gave me a foundation to understand what I was doing there. And I was able to identify how can I help you or support you in doing the best job that you could. So it was amazing. I love it. I put it on my resume uh, proudly because not a lot of people can say that they intern in the ombudsman's office. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for seeing that, you know, too, the method to our madness. I know, I know up front, it might have seemed a little uh, tedious, you know, um, theory, theory, you know, has its place. It's not everything, but practice is, is big too. And now you're actually, you know, you're a practitioner now. You're in higher ed. You're a practitioner. By any chance, you know, without, you know, having to name names, have you come across or seen any situations of conflict that maybe would benefit from a mediator since oh, you're in higher ed? A hundred percent. Like a hundred and hundred percent. And I think it was, um, I think when I was reading some of the papers that you had me read was that the ombudsman almost serves as a process before serious things get even worse and it gets to litigation. And so how do you have people come together to really discuss the issues at hand and how can there be a win-win uh, resolution for both, or at least so that um, things don't get too 
get much worse, if that makes sense. Uh, but I'll, I'll keep it to a minimum. Yes, the ombudsman needs to be on campus because if people know how you read, there's a lot of different things going on, a lot of different ide uh, ideologies and a lot of conflicts, just like any organization. You know, ombudsman is not just for higher ed, like I learned with you. It's in businesses, it's in a lot of different places. And it really serves as a point where, how do we save this before things get worse, if that makes sense? And so we can see the iceberg and we know it's coming. How do we prevent ourselves and change the propellers so that we can actually get on the same page? I hope that was a good analogy or a metaphor. No, I'm not perfect. sure. But yeah, yeah, that, that's why I see it. So, yes, absolutely. That would prevent the Titanic from sinking. Like yeah. that's that's what you want to do is you want to save the Titanic. You want to veer off before you get to that iceberg. You, do, you don't want to get to that iceberg because you can't be too confident and cocky in the man-made work of the right. <laughs> of that. I mean, work. If you're meeting or even thinking about talking to an uh, ombudsman, it doesn't necessarily have to be personal conflict, but it's just, you know, period. But when we think about mediation is, OK, we have this conflict these are the possible outcomes. And so if we know that we're on a ship and we're going somewhere and we see three different icebergs because we know they're going to be there, right? And so we're on a ship, we're in the water, it's cold, everything's conducive to us actually hitting that iceberg. We have this opportunity in this moment to say, how do we avoid that? You know what I mean? And so how do we get it to a point where is this something that needs to get to the next level of where there's no return, if that makes any sense. And I, I like that there's there's an intimacy in going through that process. And I, let me just make it clear that Hennup never let me into the meetings when it was private stuff. I don't know any privy stuff, but I think there was a respect and honor that comes into place when learning those things. So that, that's my little, little tidbit. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you. To give people just some like general tendencies that I think existed now and we we see it to this very day is um you know i would see professors maybe one is a chair and one is beneath that person right but that's in itself a position that changes who would have offices with their doors wide open and instead of getting out of their seats and standing up and talking to each other having a conversation there's this idea and, and it might be accentuated by the the north dakota nice or the midwest nice that it's a whole nother <laughs> philosophy um, north dakota <laughs> nice. <laughs> that we could talk uh, about. Uh, I could ask you about that. But instead of doing that, they would write in all caps to each other on emails yes. and send it to each other. Yeah. You would see people in the humanities and people in STEM, sometimes gendered, but not sometimes not gendered, who are in tension to with each other when there is a budget that is falling or when there's budgetary uh, crisis. You saw yeah. one of the big issues at that time is how do you deal with an explicitly racist pass and a statue and an emblem and a logo and uh, without pissing off the white folk generally who want the quote unquote preserver preservation of the tradition along with the indigenous folk who say you have commercialized our tribe and subscribe yeah. to the name that our enemies have you know uh, put upon us but even yeah. even that is not the cleanest because there, there were white folk who were against that emblem, and then there were indigenous people who wanted to reclaim the yeah. title that their enemies had given them. And so grappling with that, and we see some of that too. Now, y'all in Virginia, we see people arguing even to this day in other places yeah. about what to do with these Confederate statues and yeah. you know, flags and emblems and, and symbols. So. <laughs> I, I see some of that. I, I don't know if you had some thoughts on either North Dakota nice or or the, those other situations that people were grappling with. Gotcha. I, I think uh, the best way to address this topic is to talk about what's not being done. And so you and I both know when we were in, at UND at North Dakota at the time, there was a lot of stuff going on. I'm pretty sure people saw it in the news with blackface. We had the Myra model that was being int introduced to the university. So there was this budget model where things had to be taken away. There was a big fallout with that. And then with that, we also had, you know, the fighting Sioux name um, and, and that issue with the university. They, uh, by the time I left, they had already changed it over. But I think what is happening or what did not happen was that there was a no conversation to learn about both sides wasn't emphasized. It was, this is where I stand, this is where you stand, and then you have to agree with me 
you have to agree with me, but there was no mediation. Like there was no conversation that was said, you know what, why do you feel the way that you feel about this? You know what I mean? And so that is the, unfortunately the point that we have right now. You know, once it was announced that the statues were coming down, you see people that are all for it. Rah, 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 let's do it, blah, blah, blah. That offends me. And then you got the people that actually, like you said, support this uh, tradition, as they would say, and they their backlash is, okay, we're going to take down this, we're going to take down that. No one is communicating. No one is mediating the issue. And if they are, we don't see that. It's maybe happening in pockets and silos. But right now, everyone's trying to get their voice the loudest because right now the loudest voice is making the most influence, unfortunately. And so I hope that that was a safe way of addressing uh, your question. It was, it very much was. I appreciate that. Like, they're only gonna grow more distant from each other if they're not hanging around each other. You know, there are a exactly. lot of people who say, you know, that they'll know you by who your friends are. And yeah. you know, I don't think that as a piece of dogma, but I do think that there's something informative about that that Absolutely. the people you hang around with are going to have an effect on the way that you look at things, the way that you examine things. So that if there's going to be any sort of, you know, mediation or agreement between these seemingly diametrically opposed sides, it has to begin first with listening to each other. We might right. still stay with the same stances and positions we have, but at a bare minimum, we, you know, we, we still got to, see each other, you know? And um, I, I don't know how you feel about this segue, but I'll try to make it a relevant segue because I think it was very interesting. And we touched on your experience in Japan earlier, but I think the idea of you having been in Japan, having been in North Dakota and being in Virginia, you know, you're a well-traveled man. Not a lot of people who have been to all these places, it's given you a particular view that maybe makes you more a citizen of the world than, than other people who may be more narrow because they've not been able to listen to these different cultures. But recently, uh, one of my favorite rappers, the RZA of the Wu-Tang Clan, has been doing these things called 36 Cinema, where he plays a, a whole movie and film with a commentary. And a lot of it is the, the films that have been the background behind the Wu-Tang Clan's music. Recently, he did one called Shogun Assassin, which I, I watched and, and I heard his, his commentary. And the premise of that movie is this idea of a ronin or a person who was a samurai and who worked for the shogun was the head yeah. assassin of the shogun but the shogun was afraid of him and he was not afraid of the so shogun so he sends his ninja assassins and spies to assassinate his own assassin and his yeah. assassin escapes with a little baby in a cart and yep. that baby in the cart the whole movie proceeds in this epic battle of all the shogun's lesser assassins going against the ex assassin the reason i bring up this uh, Japanophile movie or film that was commented on by the RZA is because you had some experience with there. And I know part of your journey as an academic hustler has also been emphasizing and, and you, I think you literally used the word Ronin, which is another thing that I caught up with me because I've been obsessed with this idea forever from Rurouni Kenshin, from so many different anime oh. and manga. Yep. So can you talk to us a little bit about the idea of a Ronin and, and how that's, that's helped you? Yes, you know, that's that was a good segue, by the way. That that was smooth. That was a smooth transition. Uh, you know, when I learned about uh when I was in Japan, I had always loved watching like anime, samurai, martial arts movie. My dad kind of loved those, not, not even kind of, he loves those movies. Uh shout outs to all the uh, fathers out there, by the way. Happy belated Father's Day. Um but one of the things I remember as a child growing up, we, we watched Kung Fu movies. And so it, in, it involved uh, ninjas, samurais. And so being in Japan, to me, it was an exciting opportunity to learn about the culture of Japan. And when I learned what a ronin samurai was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, was an, a, it, it was a samurai who no longer had a master. Yep. And so they would have to do things to one prepare for themselves, you know, maybe do little, little leases here and there, do contract killings or contract support, whatever they had to do. But like you said, the samurai was no longer loyal to whoever his master was. And so I use Ronin as a way to somewhat describe myself, one, bringing in a context of what I learned by being there, but then also the importance of when I work with my students and I work in higher ed, I'm not... While I love like the organization or whoever I'm working for, I don't subscribe to everything of what 
the 50,000 foot view of what higher ed is. And so if I am not a slave to the industry, that gives me peace of mind in knowing that I can do what I deal or what I believe is best for my students, best for my colleagues and best for them at that time. And I think that's where that, that mediation comes into play to bring it right back is that I don't have anything pulling me. Now, do I have restraints? Yes. Am I the one providing my own job? No, but just the understanding of the, the, the Ronin ideology of a samurai is that they're no longer being controlled. And so they're walking away with the skills that they already had. And so we think sometimes when we walk away and we're not, um, we're operating within an organization, we're tied to what they think we should be doing. But once that cord is snapped, same thing as when we're talking about with uh, the statues and, and the beliefs of people of oppression that perpetuate oppression, those ideologies, once you cut that cord is, I don't have to treat this person this way. You telling me once I let go of that, I can just be myself and really see this person for who this is and I can make my own decisions. That to me is what, what makes me a well-rounded uh, Ronin. I hope that answers your question, but yes. Man, you gave me personal advice. I wish I had heard this message five years ago when I was graduating from my own master's program. Over the past five years, you know, I have played with this idea of what is the role or what's the relationship between me and the institution. Mm. My parents pushed heavy on just getting my degree as quick as possible and then working for the institution. I did that and I did it twice and it didn't work out for me, maybe because I was too much of a firebrand and I was not into self-preservation as much. If I was, mm. I would have taken the advice that you said and, and focus less on the systemic matters. And maybe I try to do things too systemically and focus on the local and the individual. I wanted to affect change in both of those categories, but maybe I would have affected more systemic change by focusing more on the local and individual, which I was mm. very successful at in my role in North Dakota and later in Merced and in Central you California. Were. And then after that, I went the opposite direction. You know, I was a Lyft driver for a couple of years, which is, you know, totally mm. outside of academia, totally different field. And people are like, why is a, a man with a master's degree out there, you know, driving Lyft? Like people didn't believe it. I had random strangers, you know, a couple of whom I met and, and stayed in contact with, but who could be like, I could tell you college educated, man, just by talking. They're like, what, do, what are you doing here? You know, some of them <laughs> give me fat tips, but some of them, you know, they'd be baffled. But it, it gave me time to reflect because then I was totally on my own. I was like a Ronin with no contracts. And then this past year, I've been working in education again, but now at the K-12 level as a teacher. So I've been, first I was a third party independent contractor for an organization, subbing at all these different schools from transitional kindergarten, which is a new thing they made up between preschool and kindergarten, all the way wow. to 12th grade. And then I narrowed the focus down and worked for one site or actually two sites, but one school. And I was working just TK again, but only a few of those students, predominantly kindergarten to fourth grade. And now I'm, I'm in summer break and got a new year coming. And I'm, I'm constantly reflecting on this idea that you said of how can I, without having to be subject to, you know, all of the doctrinaire of the bigger institution, use it, you know, like use it, let, like let them use me, but also use them. So mm. that you know, it's not parasitic in either way, but it's mutually right. beneficial. Everybody's being built up. So, man, I, I, I appreciate that, man. Is there are there any last final thoughts or commentaries? If you have anything ever to plug, we're gonna throw it back on this YouTube. But also, we could always come back for another episode too, whenever you're ready. Yo, first of all, I would love to do a part two. Like I'm already enjoying this, right? Uh, and so uh, the only thing, my parting words would just be. Uh, one, enjoy these conversations that we are having, this platform that uh, uh, Henoch has done, has one, refreshed me and allowed me to even think back to those times of, like you said, being two black men in North Dakota, which we could go into, like, this would have to be a series or something, because you know, I'm pretty sure people want to be like, the one number question, there was black people in North Dakota? Yeah. Yes, there were, but we can get that into the next segment. Um, I wish everybody well, and I wish everybody um, the best of success and understand the importance of these conversations that we are having now. You know, you and I both know we can reflect on there were bad, but then there were also good experiences for us. And so we can laugh at them now because we got through them and we're going through them, you know, well, there will be new journeys to take on. And so uh, 
be on the lookout for something dealing with the Ronin and education. 